This is Tokyo Shibuya Crossing, and they say at busy times, a thousand people cross at every turn of the lights. But if you know Tokyo, you know that it's a city that exists on many levels. This time, I take to the streets in Japan's biggest city. It's more than 80,000 restaurants in Tokyo alone. The cherry blossoms are in bloom, and it's 13 million people are living it up on a dazzling array of magnificent cuisine. Let's go to someone's house. Kanpai! Kanpai! <laughs> it's the land of the salaryman. And believe me, these guys know how to eat. It may not be one of my favourite fishes, but this is one of my favourite dishes. Just a few steps from one of the busiest intersections in the world are some of the smallest restaurants you'll ever see. This is called Nongbe Yokucho, which is sometimes translated as Drinker's Alley. In here, there are tiny little restaurants, probably no bigger than your bathroom at home, that seat a literal handful of diners. The owner of this little restaurant, Chizuru-san, been running the same place for 28 years. And for her, it's not about big bucks or huge restaurants. It's about hospitality. Even with just two or three other punters in here, it's a full house. <laughs> but the food looks good. <laughs> this restaurant's called Enoki, and its owner, chef, and mother, Chizuru Doi, has a very simple philosophy. She makes what she believes will make her guests feel happy. If you want an intensely personal experience with Japanese food culture, this is the place. How many restaurants do you go to where you get introduced to every single person in the place? I like it already. Mm. <laughs> It's as if you have your own brilliant home cook sharing her kitchen with the world. And today it begins with an arrow squid and wasabi starter. Spot on. Positively spacious in here now. <laughs> Next is potato salad. <laughs> so this potato salad is her speciality. She gets potatoes from Hokkaido and she makes it fresh every day. I can see why they like it. Japanese potato salad is one of my favorites and this is one of the best I've had. <laughs> I've had to try something I haven't tried before, and it's actually the, the fin of a puffer fish, a poisonous puffer fish, that's dried and slightly grilled and then dipped and soaked in hot sake. And they think of everything. Yep. It didn't take long before I was feeling completely comfortable with my new friends. <laughs> maybe it was being forced into each other's personal space, or maybe it was the fugu fin, or maybe it was both. This is a place, a tiny little place, where people come in after work. And Jizuru san says that, you know, if people come straight from work and they take all their worries from work home and then they, they give those worries to their family, it's not good. So if they come in here, they have a bite to eat, they have a beer, they relax, and they go home with a big smile on their face, their job's done. <clears throat> Tell you what, I'm going to be going home with a big smile on my face tonight. Thirteen million people live in Tokyo. It's one of the world's truly global cities. And if I can give you a tip, the best way to get around is on a bike. The workforce of this city is mostly men and women who work in offices. We call them suits, the Japanese call them salarymen and office ladies. And they're a phenomenon. The 
Japanese work ethic is world renowned. They work incredibly hard and the hours are long. So it's no wonder they've come up with so many great ways to let off steam. If a salary man had a spiritual home outside the office, it'd be a place like this in Izakaya. There's literally tens of thousands just here in Tokyo alone, and they're a must-visit location if you ever come to Japan. They're kind of like a pub and they're kind of like a restaurant, but they really fall halfway in between. In Japan, you never drink anything alcoholic without having some food to go along with it. And in Izakaya, where they are so casual and so lively, the food can just be absolutely fascinating. You've got staples like these edamame, and sashimi, and of course, fried chicken. And izakayas often create their own signature dishes. And here at Shirobe, it's aburi shime saba, or torched marinated mackerel. Mackerel is not usually one of my favorite fish. I find it a bit oily and overpowering, but this has been lightly marinated or keeled in vinegar, which takes away some of that oily flavor. And then with the blow torching on top as well, you get almost a crust and it's almost like fried fish and sashimi all in one bite. It may not be one of my favorite fishes, but this is one of my favorite dishes. Almost every izakaya in Japan will serve fried chicken, or as it's known here, karaage. And the best cut for karaage is chicken thigh. We're cooking it three times over very high heat. I want to leave these cuts fairly big, so just maybe the thigh fillet part in half. And a really quick marinade. You don't need to marinate chicken for too long. Some soy sauce. A few tablespoons, some sake. The old favorite. A couple of tablespoons of that. And then some sugar, and I tend to use sugar a lot whenever I'm using soy sauce just to balance out the flavor there. Great about a tablespoon of ginger. So all, all I'm after from this ginger is actually the juice. And that way we get all the flavor of the ginger without the texture of it. Perfect for a marinade like this. I can just leave this for about 10 minutes or so. The secret to a good karage is this. It's katakuriko, and that's uh, potato flour. And chicken's been marinating, so we'll just take it out of the marinade and toss it through. And this is a really important part of cooking karage. If you let the air go over the top of the dusted chicken for about five minutes, it'll give you a really crispy coating when it's fried and it'll also allow the coating to stick to the outside of the chicken. Now we're ready to fry. We want a really hot oil upwards of 175, so 175, 180 or so. And this is exactly where we are right now. Another best friend for this process is one of these, kitchen timer. And we'll set it to five minutes because that's the whole process from start to finish. So five minutes, and we'll drop in maybe four or five of these pieces, just to start with. Go. These go in for a minute first. You don't want to overcrowd a pot like this because that'll really reduce the temperature of the oil. Do it in batches and that will keep our oil hot and make sure you get the right results when you're frying. Just take those out and I'll leave them on a rack here to rest for another 30 seconds. While it's resting, that residual heat is working its way through the meat. Back in for another 30 seconds. The other thing that this does, it allows you to really hit the chicken with a blast of oil because as you're taking the chicken out, the oil's coming back up to temperature just by a few degrees and that can really make a difference. You can see how the color is changing. What we're looking for is a lovely golden brown, or as they say in Japanese, kitsune iro. And the literal translation of that is the color of a fox. It's our last fry now, so final 30 seconds. It's nice and crispy on the outside, but if you feel the inside, it's still slightly raw. But after the final fry and the final rest, it should be just perfect. And there's our pieces of chicken ready to come out. They're nice and golden brown or the color of a fox. 
a final two minutes of resting and they should be absolutely perfect inside. Drop on our garnishes, piece of lemon and one little shishito pepper and then what's Japanese fried chicken without Japanese mayonnaise? Big blob of that there. And our final little touch, shishimi togarashi. It's a mix of seven different spices. And just to flavor our mayonnaise, a touch of that on top. There we have it. Karage, Japanese fried chicken, fried three times. Tatsuya Yamamoto is a salary man. Six days a week, he starts work at 8 a.m. and finishes at 10 p.m. Japanese salary man is two or three types of salary. One is that he works every day and he works every day. One is that he works every day and he works every day. One is that he works every day and he works every day. One is that he works every day. 不安があってやり続ける人っていうのがいて、まあ電車の人にとってはすごいいいことなんじゃないかなと思ってます。Today is a special day. It's Hanami or Cherry Blossom time. And as the youngest salary man in his company, it's Tatsuya's job to claim a spot for his company party. もし席取れてないのに先輩たちが来たったと来ちゃったとか大問題なんで、まあそこは必死に取りに行くイベントですね。The party isn't scheduled to start for several hours, so Tatsuya has a long way ahead of him. So we'll come back and see how he's going later on. But first, a spot of golf, Japan style. The life of a Japanese businessman or a salaryman, as they're known as here, can sometimes seem pretty bleak. Long hours working at your desk, working for the man, and sometimes coming to a place like this, a driving range to let off some steam. And whereas we may look at our retirement as strolling along a beach or opening a little cafe in the Blue Mountains, a Japanese salaryman tends to have one thing on his mind, and that's breaking the bonds of corporate slavery and opening his own ramen shop. Ramen is Japan's soul food. And there's four main kinds shio, shoyu, tonkotsu, and miso. But the possibilities are endless. This is yuzu shio ramen, the specialty here at Afuri. This is what I love about ramen in this little frame of a bowl here. Every single piece and item has been thought about, even down to the, the line of sight from the diner sitting down to see those mountains reminiscent of the name of this restaurant. The angle of the piece of nori, the little cross of yuzu citron here. We often think of wine as being the terroir of a particular region or the expression of a particular grape, but ramen goes kind of the opposite way. It, it combines things from all over the place to give you, I guess, a, a chef's or an artist's eye view of the entire world, all framed in one little bowl. Class is about to begin at Tokyo's Yamato Ramen School. And this is where salarymen come to learn the secrets of making good ramen before they open their restaurants. It's the brainchild of Kaoru Fuji, an engineer who designs noodle machines. There's one thing that defines great ramen. It's the stock or the soup base. And it's made from so many different ingredients, it's almost baffling to see how much goes into it. These are infused oils here, infused with shrimp and scallop and mackerel, garlic, leek, ginger, and all of these things are 
then added to a soup base, which is made, and here they're making up their, uh, their, their meat-based portions of the soup. So we've got some chicken feet there, pig's trotters here. They're skimming to remove the scum that rises to the top, which can make the soup both cloudy and bitter. Over here, we've got whole chickens. Down there, there's uh, pork. Uh, and these are just the meat elements. Tomorrow, these guys will be coming back and they'll be making up stocks of, of sardines and vegetables and other things that all go together that must be in complete balance and harmony to make a good ramen. This is a slightly scientific process here, so they're on induction stoves, We're just keeping it at a constant temperature and a constant boil. The level gets too high, there's too much water in there, the level gets too low, and it's too concentrated. It's all about extracting the flavour as purely as possible. The sheer number of ingredients and the amount of effort that goes into preparing each one exactly correctly is mind-boggling. <laughs> Since he's been coming to this school, he's been getting more and more confident that he can make great tonkotsu miso ramen. Takahiro Inoue is one of the salarymen who's made the move to pursue his dream of opening a ramen restaurant. For over 30 years, he worked at the same insurance company, but then a personal tragedy changed his life. まあ、あの、人間何が起こるかわからないと。いつ自分も明日死んじゃうかもしれないと。だったらば、あの、今、あの、体が健康なうちにやりたいことをやろうと。ま、その一つがリスクを犯して、一生働けるしと、やりたい
It's quite rich, so you don't want to serve too much per portion. He had salt, finely chopped shio kombu, washed and dried capers, olive oil, white pepper, and gently mixes it together. A tare puree is made with Fuji apples and ginger, soy, mirin, garlic, and glucose. It's kind of like that. There you go. And then you blend it. And the sauce is simply freshly grated Shizuoka wasabi mixed with the hyper-reduced chicken jus and sherry vinegar. Just whisk it in. And just taste it, see if it's okay. Oh, it's very good. Mm. Whoa. <laughs> the tartare is molded and placed on steamed koshi curry rice. Blanched nanohana sits on top of the beef. And then we uh, go ahead and make it all pretty. And that process begins with crisp shallots, some baby herbs, and then the apple and ginger tare, and finally, that wasabi jus. With the wasabi sauce, uh, we pour it at the table. So finally it's party time and crowds have gathered under the cherry blossoms right around Tokyo for Japan's favourite time of year. In Japan there's even a phrase, hana yori dango, which means the food is just as important as the view. So today I'm making a dish called sakura mochi, which is uh, a, a sweet. We've got to start with these. These are cherry leaves that have been pickled in a really strong brine solution so that they're fragrant and also a little salty. I just need to soak those in some fresh water to remove some of the salt. We don't want to remove all of the salt because actually the salty flavour is what makes this dish so special. It's the contrast between the salty pickled cherry leaves and this sweet bean paste. And the way I've made this is just soak some red beans overnight, boil them for two or three hours with some sugar and ground them into a paste. And that's what this is called anko bean paste. Next thing I need to do is to make our batter and so into that goes our glutinous rice flour, shiro tamako, about a tablespoon of sugar and slowly add some water. It's important to add the water slowly so that you can mix out all of the lumps from this glutinous rice flour because it does tend to stick together. That batter's nice and smooth now. So I need to add in our plain flour. Need to mix this through really well, adding more of that water so that there aren't any lumps in there. And the last ingredient, traditionally, a touch of food coloring to make the batter a pink color, reminiscent of these blossoms here. That's looking good now, it's nice and silky and also a light pink. We can start laying out these cherry leaves. Some people think eating the leaves is a bit funny but they really do have a wonderful flavour and I think even if they didn't the Japanese would eat them anyway. Just there's something about the combination of food and celebration. They'd find some way to incorporate cherry into the food even if it didn't taste good at all. As well as that, make some balls of this red bean paste. There's our balls done, and I think it's time to start making our crepes. Add a tablespoon into the pan and smooth it out into a wider circle. And it will just dry on top, and you can see it happening right now. And as soon as that's dry, just flip it over for a few seconds on the other side and then take it out of the pan. And after these crepes are cooked, 
All we really need to do is take a ball of our red bean paste, fold it together and pinch one end of the crepe down and then wrap around one of these cherry leaves. And that's it, that's our sakura mochi. Tatsuya-san's first job as a salary man has come off pretty well. I think he's earned one of these. Next time, I venture to the outskirts of Tokyo to taste sublime tofu. Really wonderful. Then back into the heart to meet the chef of Asia's number one restaurant, Yoshihiro Narisawa. He's given form to an experience. And just wait until you see the food halls. Not a blemish anywhere. These are the supermodels of fruit and vegetable, for better or worse.